Welcome to our very first book show, which is absolutely momentous. I am delighted, as you see, Ms. McKaiser, someone who loves books, a broadcaster, journalist, to be bringing you a series with my very good friend, our media colleague, Joanne Joseph. Great to be here, Yubi. I'm so excited about the series. I am too. I'm, yeah. First of all, I'm excited about working with you. Thank you. We've been colleagues before on a different platform. We've never actually worked together on a particular show. So it's really, really awesome. And one of the coolest things about becoming your friend <laughs> is that we both love books so much. We and do. We have a country that really needs to build a love of more reading than we currently yeah. do. And I actually can't count the number of conversations we've had about books on the yeah. phone, right? So we spent hours talking about literature, the execution of books and so forth. And now we actually we get to talk to, to our public and our friends out there about uh, all these private conversations we're having about literature. I, I'm, yeah. I'm delighted. And we've got a number of partners that have made this possible. Um, there's a bunch of publishers that uh, we'll mention that really have put their money behind this project and understands the importance of instilling that love of reading uh, in every single person in this country. Yeah. I think one of the, the problems has been in the last few years, I mean, we, we, had, we had someone like Jenny Chris Williams really developing a love for reading through mm. her shows in the last uh, few decades, actually. And, you know, things have quietened down since then. We haven't really had a dedicated book That's show. Right. Um, and, and technology now allows us to bring this online and democratize yeah. it and just make it available to so many, Absolutely. People, to so many people. Absolutely. And that's why I'm delighted that we are involved in the project. Uh, also exclusive books. We're coming from this absolutely gorgeous store yes. right here at Santon City. You can see the shot behind us. It really is amazing. I think, I mean, most of their stores are beautifully done, but this one in particular is just aesthetically absolutely stunning. And then we've got we've got Pam McMillan, Jonathan Ball. Who else do we have? Uh, we've got uh, indie publishers, and we've got Jakana on board as well. So, so uh, that, that should give you a pretty good idea of the widespread of literature you're going to be exposed to in the next few months as we take the show it's forward. It's Christmas. Uh, you know, it, it's kind of interesting talking about Jenny. One of the things Jen used to do uh, on a certain radio station is to have a Christmas book show, <laughs> which course. is like holiday reads. Yeah. And I often, I mean, I like that as someone who wants people to buy books. Yeah. We can't have enough people reading books, right? Uh, because we have a small book market in South Africa. But I often wonder the nerd in me about the idea of a holiday read. Yeah. Do, do you have such a pile of books that is specifically for the holiday? I, I have three piles of books <laughs> next to my bed and no space for anything else. Um, but, but they're all very varied reads. Uh, you know, I found, unfortunately, during COVID, I was not able to read the way I normally do, right? So so the kind of literature I'd, I'd have been consuming, I was just not able to concentrate on reading the way mm -hmm. I normally do. So I have this massive backlog of both what would be considered holiday reads, sure. as, as well as very serious literature, nonfiction, um, you know, that, that I need to get through. Uh, so, so all of it now yeah. falls under the general umbrella of holiday <laughs> reads because I have to get through all of it. In the next I'm exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. When we put together the show, we had to think in part, this being the very first episode, what might be holiday <laughs> reads that you are interested in buying. Yeah. And um, I'm probably an anomaly in that way. The idea of mm -hmm. something you buy at the airport that you can quickly read over two hours on mm -hmm. your way from Joburg to Cape Town mm -hmm. doesn't quite exist for me. If I want to read complete light stuff, quote unquote, I'll read it. But if I want to read a complicated new philosophy textbook over Christmas, no one must tell me that is not fit for Christmas. <laughs> exactly. I totally agree with that. And I, I read much like you as well. I get into moods. And when I'm in a particular mood, uh, I, I'm now in a, in, a, in a mood where I'm reading a lot of historical fiction. So that's where it, I don't want to be here at the moment. I want to be in the past. Mm. And, and I'm going to travel through the past for the next few weeks. And then I'm going to switch all of a sudden yeah. to something perhaps quite futuristic. Yeah. And, and I think... I think the shows are probably going to switch with those. Well, movies. we're not going to discriminate on genre. We're going to bring you shows about children's book, about cooking books that you might have, fiction, non-fiction. Joanne and I had a very long telephone conversation the other day about some of the genre classifications. They're kind of useful. You can see them here, South African non-fiction there. Then it says African fiction. Here behind me it says Afrikaans of Fixi. Um, if you are Yeltsmalt Wetalach or even multilingual. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is that every book is special. A children's book can be complicated social commentary about society. True. I mean, one of the books that uh, that you'll see coming up in the in the uh, the episodes we're doing is the Ichabod by J.K. Rowling. I didn't expect it to be quite such a political read. So, so yeah. look out for that one. We're going to be chatting to kids about that one in the in the next couple of episodes as well. 
But nonetheless, you've got something that you've been looking at, and, and this takes us into back into where we come from, really, which is the world of media. Um, and I see that, that you took a look at uh, Anton Harbour's book, so for the record. So, can I tell you about it? Yeah, Yeah, because um, I, I, I mentioned it to you. Uh, you haven't yet had a chance to read it. No, it it's an interesting book, mm -hmm. and I think as a journalist, you will be absolutely fascinated by it. So basically what he set out to do, Joe, is to ask, where do things go wrong and how did they go wrong at the Sunday Times in particular? Yeah. There have been a series of stories over the last couple of years on the front pages of the Sunday Times, like the road unit story, for example, the rendition story, that really managed to, from a commercial point of view, get the sales up because you've got these sexy, jazzed up stories on the front page. Yeah. And it all completely blew, blew up in the faces of the editors as well yeah. as some of our country's most senior journalists. Um, Pete John Perry, Stefan Hofstetter, Mozilla Kazua, Africa. And what Anton does in this book is to basically say, let's do journalism 101. Mm -hmm. Why did things go wrong? How did they get go wrong? And what are the lessons to be learned in the newsroom? And one of the many theses that he confirms is that one of the most basic problems in the Sunday Times is that they, they're arrogant. They, they, they firstly believe that they can get away with bypassing nuance and complexity mm -hmm. and so they like black and white stories so one of the things he found is that sometimes when he went to speak to the sources that these guys had spoken to the source will have given them data that suggests a particular claim that they make is complicated but by the time the story lands on the front page of the sunday times it has been boiled down to the idea of there's a clear right and there's a clear clear wrong and basically what anton is suggesting is that what seduced the editors at the Sunday Times is the idea that a simple narrative around black and white, good and evil, is a better commercial proposition than putting a complex story on your front page. Hmm. But, which is really challenging for us as journalists because you and I grapple with this all the time. Yeah. Complexity is hard to sell, but the lack of complexity is what caused this shameful episode of the Sunday Times. So, so what was it? A case of just rushing stories to print without uh, without researching them properly because of a commercial no, imperative? I'm what? afraid it was worse than that. Eh? Yeah. One of the things that they did is they sometimes decided which of the different truths is the truth and then basically cut off a complicated story. So they'll fly to Durban, speak to a top cop, have a massive conversation, two, three hours long, the guy will say to them, this claim about me is wrong. I can take you to go and have a look at the records. You will see that I couldn't have been at this particular point in time where this source of yours claims that I was at. But by the time you get back to Joburg, the Sunday Times decides that's just too much detail. It's too much complexity. The version that we think is probably true is this version. And then it gets rewritten as a simpler story. So that is actually worse than what you're suggesting because it's an intentional choosing of a story that you think is a story that will just make for a better set of sales at the Willis. Extremely dangerous from, from what it sounds like, Yugi. But are there lessons to be learned for other newsrooms from, from the way the Sunday Times... The lesson to be news? learned is that even though sales are going down for media products, we cannot afford to sacrifice our integrity. Triangulating stories, fact-checking, and being nerdish about evidence remain critically important, particularly in an era of fake news where there's so much bad news around which media platforms should be trusted and you've got politicians, nefarious interests suggesting don't trust the media. And when we need to make sure our credibility is beyond reproach as journalists, we cannot afford to skim on triangulation. So, so there's a big lesson to be learned that there, the particularly with the, the reality of newsrooms, the juniorization, the cutting backs exactly. on, on staff and all the rest. Exactly. Okay. The only yeah. criticism I have is a minor criticism of the book, which is mm -hmm. that I think Anton could also have criticised himself a little bit better. Some of the guys that he mentions, they were award-winning journalists. Mm -hmm. And Anton himself sat on one or two committees mm -hmm. that gave them awards. And when the people who were maligned as a result of bad journalism said, hey, can you take the awards back? I think Anton and his colleagues on the committees were a little bit too slow to acknowledge that they too were seduced by bad journalism. Yeah, yeah. and it's easy to be. And it's, it's, it's yeah, absolutely it's easy. Expert, so it's a book that I recommend. Yeah. Um, a lot of his friends in journalism won't like the book because it's tough on us as journalists. Which but that kind of self, it, yeah, it is, right? Because if you're not tough as a journalist on yourself, 
That's when you give the ANC permission to come up with things like a media appeals tribunal, which is the last thing that we actually want. So this is our very first book that we have reviewed on the show. I do recommend it, particularly if you're a journalist. It is worth reading. It's well written. It's clear. And those are good reasons to buy it. Right. Yeah. So, so you've been doing lots of other reading in addition to this. What else have you got for us? Well, I am delighted to say I've pre-recorded an interview with Rahana Rousseau, who's also one of our most senior journalists in the country. And another terrible story in a good journalistic way, but bad for the country, politically. And it's entitled Predator Politics. And I really hope that everyone will enjoy the interview that I did with Rahana Rousseau. I'm absolutely delighted to be speaking to Rahana Rousseau. I often reference her as the person responsible for my journalism career. I've written about that before as well. Uh, she's the first one who called me up and said, hey, your letter to the editor is decent enough to turn into a guest column at Business Day. And next thing, she saw me invited me to write for Weekender. And the rest, as they say, is history. Bad history for those who don't like <laughs> politics. Good history for those who like disruption. So I'm a huge fan of Rahana as a friend, as a mentor, and an excellent author. And she has a third book out, which is what we're going to talk about right now, Predator Politics. Rahana, for your mora, and congratulations on another book. Good morning, Eusebius. Thank you very much. Thank you for your kind words. The first two books were works of fiction. This is a work of non-fiction. Predator politics, what was the most important question or story that you wanted to either explore or tell? Um, this book was commissioned by my publisher, who had been approached by Fred Daniel, who had a court case coming up and thought that there might be a good book in his story. Um, there's an excellent book <laughs> in his story. Um, his story is not over yet. He is on his way to the North Gauteng High Court, where he's bringing a damages case against government officials and politicians and government agencies of one billion rand because of harassment that he suffered after he blew the whistle on corruption involving land claims. Hmm. Now, this is part of the special uh, edition of this new podcast series with a bunch of publishers, including your own and exclusive books. So a lot of people listening and watching this conversation will buy a copy of this book, Predator Politics, as part of their Christmas buy, but give them a basic pricey of how the story goes. It's a politically significant book. It is about land, it's about identity, it is about harassment, as you say, but it's also fundamentally about big men in politics. Yes, it is. And the biggest man in the book, in politics, is our Deputy President Didi Mabuza. Um, the book's about Fred Daniel, who bought huge amounts of land in southern Mpumalanga to build a private nature reserve, um, driven by his own belief that nature can heal itself after it's been ravaged by humans. So he carefully healed huge amounts of land in Mpumalanga, which had been ravaged by asbestos mining and poor farming practices, and then discovered that land that he owned contained archaeological um, relics, which explain the story of life on Earth. So mm -hmm. the land became even more important. Um, he decided that he would conserve it. He wanted to, to donate it as a gift to the country once he had completed his project. Mm -hmm. And then um, as soon as Kersner International came to look at his land and decided to build a one and only resorts, two one and only resorts on his land, government officials started being intransigent mm. and it appears tried to get the project to, for themselves to get a slice of the project. So what is blew the whistle. I mean, the deputy president even managed to get an honorary mention in the subtitle. The deputy president is key to the story. Um, so when Fred bought his farms, he carefully did due diligence on it before he invested his own millions of rands. He discovered that there were no land, no claims on his land. There were no claims on any land in the Bud Plus area. Um, but then suddenly, um, in the late 1990s, these new land claims emerged, and um, the Land Claims Commission had money to buy land for poor black people and to restore them to the land. But instead, working with corrupt white businessmen, they inflated land prices in the area and the money, of course, did not go very far. And the only people who benefited were corrupt politicians and 
corrupt businessman. What was very interesting, and readers who will buy the book will get the details, so don't give it all away, is that many politicians who have subsequently left the provinces and have become faves on the national stage have odious histories. And one of the important, important bits of memory that the book archives is how, you know, even a Jackson Tembu year and there, uh, we forget that some of these politicians who can move us to tears with a tragic family event or a personal issue that befalls them late in their career. They've got long histories and a lot of those histories um, are histories of baggage. And if we have short memories as South Africans, we will let people off the hook that shouldn't be let off the hook. You know, I don't think that it is short memories. It is shocking um, how much of the history in the book um, we all knew, we all reported on at the time. I think there's been brilliant reporting in Mpumalanga on corruption um, for decades. It's not that we forget, it's how much corruption can we cope with? How much do we need to know? How much baggage do we need to carry with us? For me, one of the most shocking things in the book, besides the fact that politicians has, have enriched themselves on the land claims process, um, you know, they talk a lot about whether we should rather, um, what's the word? Where you, <laughs> yeah, the, the willing buyer, willing seller process. Yeah. Um, and even Thabo Mbeki started this thing about white farmers being yeah. resistant to land reform. It's not white farmers who are resistant to land reform. White farmers will happily sell their land for a market price if the government wants to buy it. It's government officials like predators feeding on that land and stripping people who have been given their land back, stripping them of a right to, you know, own and then produce on the land as well. They've, they've, they've destroyed the dreams of so many poor black people and it's not white farmers doing this. If I understand you, some of those policy debates become a ruse for holding them accountable for their own failure. They've got enormous power within the existing legislative framework to make sure that they deal with land transfers. And then it's easy to talk about restitution and other mechanisms. It's not that those are unimportant or not feasible, but sometimes they are literally a way to change the subject. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And, you know, I am so impressed with Fred Daniel, who is the subject of my book. Um, Fred has been fighting corruption since the late 1990s. He blew the whistle on corrupt land claims when it wasn't threatening his own land. It was threatening the land of his neighbors. Um, it was threatening the, li the, li the lives of poor black people that he was hoping to empower through his land restoration project. So he's a whistleblower in all senses of the word. Um, and what I love about Fred, and I, I don't mean this in the romantic sense, is his determination. Mm. He's fought against this corruption using his own money in the courts for 15 years, and yep. he is not giving up. And uh -huh. that is the kind of people we need in South Africa. Uh, yeah, I want to have a, I want to explore other chapters, but I want people to buy the book and read it so that they can come to our next conversation with their own critical engagement. Second last question very quickly, and we're going to spend about one minute each on the, on the last two questions. Mm -hmm. Second last one. Um, I had a very gentle critique on social media of the book, and I wonder what your reaction to it is, your immediate reaction, a deeper reaction we can talk about in future. I, I thought to myself, I'm not in a position to know whether Fred has got skeletons, but Rahana seems to love this man. I want to <laughs> triangulate everything she says about how beautiful his politics is, whether it will all check out. Discuss 50 marks. I'm not discussing Fred's politics. Um, Fred's politics is his own. I respect his politics. Um, but absolutely, I have researched every claim that he has made in court papers and every claim that he has made stands up. Lastly, your first two books, which I still love. I think all three books matter. My favorite is still, what will people say? Uh, when I'm Minister of Education for one day, I'll make it compulsory for every high school to teach it as a text. 
Uh, the journalist in me likes your second book, New Times, as well. Absolutely important uh, work of fiction, drawing on your experience in the newsroom, also, again, with political motifs. And then this, this third work, which is very different. Give me just uh, your final reflection on the writing process, going from writing fiction, even though it's social realism, to realism, realism in nonfiction. Um, realism in nonfiction, I think that's, I see the strands, the same themes in all three of my books, fiction and nonfiction, and the theme is trauma. Um, we as South Africans have suffered huge amounts of trauma. Um, individuals in South Africa, like Fred Daniel, are battered by trauma. Fred and I connected over trauma. His experiences um, of being a whistleblower, being under threat, are the same as mine, mm -hmm. exactly the same as mine. And that helped me to identify with Fred Daniel. Beautiful note to end on. Oh, I get goosebumps. There's so much about trauma that is the South African ultimate equalizer. I wish you many happy sales with this latest book and different iterations of sales with the two novels as well. Rohana, congratulations. And thank you for speaking to me on this podcast series. Thank you for having me, Eusebius. Thank you. I am absolutely delighted to be hanging out with three friends of mine who are three of the country, the, quite frankly, the continent's best authors. And you are in for a treat for the next 20, 25 minutes or so as we discuss some of their latest work. But because we love reading as well, it's going to be interspersed with references to all sorts of other authors and books that may be of interest to you and worth buying. Uh, Zukiswa is here. Zukiswa Wana, of course, has written an incredible number of books and just awards galore. Zukiswa, how's it? I'm good, thank you. <laughs> Including, and I'll come back to it in a second, African Literature Person of the Year. Fancy, fancy titles. The other two are trying to be gracious. And <laughs> but no doubt, um, you know, we can't all be that. Maybe we'll get turns next year. <laughs> now I've got Angela McCullough, who writes just um, the most amazing works. Her latest book is Critical But Stable. Uh, Angela is here with me. And then Sue Nyati, who's shame, man. She keeps telling us she's, it took her 20 years to write this. It's finally out of her system. She's written this amazing book called um, A Family Affair. And, of course, her previous books have done just as well. It's lovely seeing all three of you. Great. Thank you very yeah. much, you say yes. You know, I don't, I don't even know where to start. Maybe let's start with you, Sue. I mean, it's been a 20-odd year labor of love. You've gone through many decades writing this book. <laughs> Congratulations on it. It's done incredibly well. No, and I think, what, within the first month, already it needed a second print run. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. that is absolutely amazing. No, thank you. Very briefly, um, summarize for us the basic plot. Who's the family in here? So this is a family saga. And the saga's go you know they sex lies drama secrets dirty secrets yeah and it's centered on the mafu family the patriarch in the family is abraham and he's the pastor and pumla is his long-standing wife supporting wife and they've got three daughters and it's through this family that we navigate you know this drama this tale that you mm. know i present here and the daughters are very different uh, police were yandi so well. And um, Zandile. and Zandile, yeah. absolutely, absolutely fascinating their lives as well. I think we've all read the book. Yes, we um, have. And it's yes. absolutely amazing. Zukusa, what was your reaction? Oh, I absolutely loved it. And remember, you are the one who recommended it to me. I was like, okay, it was on my to read list, and then you recommended it, and I was like, oh my god! And what it made me laugh so much because I was thinking about like characters that I knew from Zim and whatever. Because a lot of times people recommend books set in Zim. Because I grew up there, I always end up like getting a bit tense. I know, like, I know. <laughs> you didn't get that one right, <laughs> you know. So it was such a relief, and it was beautiful, and it was fun, and it's really been like my other book for Christmas gift this year. Oh wow, that's yeah. special. That's absolutely wonderful. One of the many things I like about the book is, and I know maybe it's just because I'm getting old and this is a compliment to you, <laughs> um, it shouldn't be, is that even though it's complex in terms of the many different characters, it wasn't difficult for me to hold the characters and have a clear idea, mm -hmm. even the personalities of the three siblings. Yes. They're very distinct. Very distinct. Absolutely. I, I really enjoyed it. I'm enjoying it. I'm still reading it. Um, what I love the most about this book, I was saying to Sue earlier, is that you know it could have been said in South Africa because the... The rituals around wedding, like a wedding and ceremony, the ceremony and all of that, and the characters as well—they're so rich and textured that you can relate to them 
even if you're not necessarily from this from a developed background. We're yeah. talking about some, a, a Jew, somebody who's from a Jewish background who said, this sounds so familiar mm. because it could be said in my own home. Absolutely, you know? so and it does travel. Yeah. You'll get there, yeah. it, you know, Cape Town, the Eastern Cape, yeah, they yeah. all make a cameo <laughs> appearance in a sense. It follows your, your experiences. Yes, exactly. And I think it just shows that we're more alike than we are different. Yeah. Yeah. And I also, you know, in the sense that, you know, you have Kumla, who's, who's Kosa, and mm. she's married to Zimbabwean. Mm. And we have a lot of those, so. And people have been migrating, you know, since time. The movement between the two countries has been very much along. Also, I struggle to de decide who was my favorite character because I enjoyed <laughs> those sisters so much. Yes. You know? Yeah. They each are so distinctive, but they're, they're fascinating and in I'm their sure own different ways. Yourself. Yourself. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> wow! Sis! That will, make, that will make sense to you. The laughter will make sense to you if you buy the book. Make sure you buy the book at exclusive. Wow, sis. And it will all make sense to you. So some of what we're going to talk about might be a little bit cryptic, but I hope that you will be intrigued wherever you're watching from to go and buy it. So I was saying to Joanne Joseph, my, my colleague and friend, that what I love about fiction mm. is how there are some serious political questions that one can explore to, uh, through it. All three of you write great humor. We'll talk about humor later if we have time. But there's some serious, serious themes, Sue, that come out of this book. And I know you wanted to provoke some conversations. I literally randomly opened, opened the book to decide what to read from. And one of the themes in the book that I want us to briefly discuss uh, is, of course, as a wedding is being prepared for, uh, Uma Koti has to be given advice by some of the elder women in the family. Um, so here's just a couple of paragraphs. The women recite the sayings like a war cry like they are preparing for battle. Season Tombi is the general stirring them up for the fight, and the morale in the room is high as the women echo her sentiments in unison. Armed with confidence, Season Tombi continues with her feverish address. Now, if you are woke, you don't, you want to close your ears round about now. Don't be deterred by the cheating. Remember, all those who are not married want to get in. They want to destroy your home. <laughs> you must fight for it, Zandile. Fight till death do you part, Zandile. You must fight till death punches are thrown into the head. Fists shaken and invisible aggressors. These women are seasoned fighters. They have battled with the known and unknowns and emerged victorious. For 25 years, I fought for my home, Zandile. Wow. Season Tom carries on. I've protected it. I you read English very well. <laughs> I stopped before the vanilla. <laughs> you know what I loved? You know what I loved about that is, is two things. It shows how even in middle class families, how gendered our lives are, obviously. And the second thing I was saying to Joe is it's interesting how women can be the can be the ones that are introverted. Yeah, to to yeah. Yeah. Why do you guys do that to yourselves? We don't do it. You do it to us. I think women are the product uh, of they, they're a product of patriarchy in terms of, you know, being agents of it, you know, um, yeah. and they uphold it. I think more, they're more effective, actually, more than the men when it comes to policing. But I don't know why um, the cycle continues, because I actually screen grabbed that exact yes. paragraph yeah, I and I posted it on Twitter because it, it sounds so familiar. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm married and I'm married uh, traditionally. Um, to a Bobo family, and and I had the same speech. I actually remember oh, wow. the speech, and it just says shivers really? down my spine because it. I could not believe it. I had not so. In, <laughs> I had not heard women in in the modern age speak that way because I don't. I, I surround myself with women. Like this. So I mean that speech just absolutely boggled my mind because I just thought, what the hell have I gotten myself into? It felt like. I mean, some kind of a horror movie because mm. that's, those were not the conversations I was having with Absolutely. my husband, you know, with my yeah. partner. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> well, Listen, I want to get on to, to Angela's book, but before we do so, another theme which is very serious is you, the exploration of violence. Mm -hmm. Bo both of you write sex really, like, stunningly, almost <laughs> beautiful. I mean, some of it is... Beautiful, rough, and everything else yeah. in between. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't quickly enough find my favorite sex scene because I wanted to read that. Um, so, warning, this is an adult <laughs> segment of the show. So, so, talk to me about two things. Writing sex and rape, including marital rape, which is not sex, it's violence. It's violence, violence yeah. Mm. I think for me, I, I always say this, that there are different kinds of sex in this book. And it's to show 
that how sex can be, you know, romantic, sensual, and sex can also be violent. So that's why, you know, there are other scenes there to, to bring that out. Because people also have a very precarious relationship with consent and what it means, you know. Mm-hmm. You need, where, where does it stop becoming, you know, like passionate tug of war sex and it actually becomes rape. Yeah. And it's, you know, and I, I kind of show that mm-hmm. throughout the book. Like, there are scenes where you, you can say, no, this is, this is not violent. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's not, you know, sensual sex. So that was another reason why I did it that way. Mm-hmm. And I think just in terms of writing sex scenes for me, I think I read a lot. So it's like anything. You read good sex scenes and bad sex scenes. And then you kind of, you know, the things that I, I hate about sex scenes, when I recreate, I try and avoid those, what I think are... I heard you say that to another interviewer who interviewed you about the book yeah. and uh, when they asked you about how do you think about writing sex and you were talking about researching and then I thought how I thought the answer was going to be the answer is going to be I'm not a virgin <laughs> do you also research your sex scenes <laughs> Vigorously, yes. <laughs> I mean, I read a lot of erotica. I mean, you get turned on in the process, but I just, you know, I also think the authenticity. If someone else is reading your sex scene and gets turned on, then it means it worked. You know? yeah. Or you, you try to turn them in. <laughs> but readers will tell you, I, I, I did get turned on. So I'm like, okay, I did a good job. So, so, so what are you, did you yeah. also Google, like, worst sex scenes ever to make sure you avoid them? Oh, you know, you know what, uh, sex scenes are the worst for me because I just always, okay, first I think of my mother, which I think a lot of authors go through. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, you do want it to not be cringeworthy, um, but yeah. there is a specific sex scene that I wrote and actually wanted to delete out of the book because I felt it when I read it out loud. What did my mother cringe. say? No, no, I cringed because I just thought it was a bit over the top um, uh, and a bit too raw. But I, but sex is raw, like that is the nature of sex. You know, it's just a natural biological thing that happens. You know, so you can't also try to be too polite about sex. I believe. I believe that you, there's, there's beautiful sex scenes that uh, evoke uh, love, make, like a sense of love mm-hmm. being shared between two people. Yeah. And then there's, yeah. as you said, there's different, then there's other kinds of sex scenes that you can be playful with sex as well. So I, mm-hmm. the, the, the cringe word these scene for me that I can do uh, is, is kind of a playful mm-hmm. sex scene between two. And also my, my, my couples are in long-term relationships, which also was a dynamic that I wanted to explore yeah. sexually because, you know, it does get tired sometimes. It gets, it does get boring sometimes yeah. when you've been together for a long time. So that was something specifically that I, I, I wanted mm-hmm. to also I hope your partner does and watch this. <laughs> Let's talk about Angela's book. I know how much you are good friends and you love Angela's work. I, I really love this book. People are obsessed with classification. Everyone is trying to classify Angela. You know, does she write what? Cry. Cry. Yeah. Or chicklets. Chicklets. <laughs> what, yeah. what, what, yeah. what is it? And this book is difficult to classify because you've got a social club, you've got all these couples, yeah. mm-hmm. and a lot of it is just about the relationships that are teased out, mm-hmm. and there happen to be plots around a particular body, mm-hmm. and if you are reductive, you will say, this is crime. Mm-hmm. But it's, 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 it's not. It's, it's not, not, right? Yeah. How, do you, how do you say it's... Uh, I, 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 I think it's just... It's, it's, just, a, it's just edge, you know, because, I mean, somebody was, somebody was making a noise on, on, on Facebook, was it? Where they were saying... Well, you know, they're used to every other every other book by Angela being crime, and this is not crime. I'm like, and it's by, pink, and I'm a and boy. Then, so and, then, and, then, and then, and then, I was like, by virtue of having a character called Julius Manamela, it is crime. <laughs> Good luck with the lawsuit. Good luck with the lawsuit, Suzuki. So There's so many themes here. Yeah. Again, this is another book where. If you if you thought fiction is not serious, firstly you write humor brilliantly, yeah. uh, as does Sue and, and, and Zuko. So all three of you, right, are very funny writers. But this is a book. It's one of those books that you could recommend in a political science class, in a sociology mm-hmm. class, in a philosophy class, mm-hmm. because it deals with with so many really important mm-hmm. uh, themes. One of the very familiar themes it deals with, and talk to me about this, um, is ostentatious displays of wealth that upwardly mobile black people in particular still grapple with. Yes, I was actually at a book club yesterday and uh, well, it was, I was addressing middle class black people and I think we spent about 30, about half of the discussion just on 
that ostentatious uh, display of wealth. But what I wanted to do with this book, and I was very uh, uh, intentional about it, was to juxtapose that ostentation with the very the, with working class people that witness it on a daily basis. And uh, I have two. I have about three characters who then are the lens that views all of this. Uh, grandiosity mm. and uh, are, are, are envious, but also, you know, kind of there's a repulsion about it as well. There's a young girl, um, so the, the the domestic worker who works for one of the couples, the Manamelas, mm. has a uh, so she brings in her young daughter. She kind of sneaks her into the quarters because there's xenophobic violence that is erupting in the informal settlement where they stay. So to protect her daughter, she brings her into this huge mansion. And the daughter uh, observes these people because they're so different from anything that she's been exposed to. And she kind of uh, uh, gives us the social commentary around, you know, how this larger than life display of wealth um, it, it, it's kind I of thought that was a wonderful caveat. You know yeah. what I loved about that yeah. is we often talk about black middle class people just as a class on their own mm. or in relation to white people. But one of the biggest inequality problems class, we have yeah. is between rich black people and poor black people. Mm. And that divide, intra black mm. inequality, is, is huge. And, it's wide and, and these hand. characters might seem minor in the story. But it's kind of wonderful to have the security guard observing the Kumalos. Yeah. Yes. You know, it's, it's, it's for me, that's that's one of the things that stand out. Yeah, and also, I mean, there's a lot of issues, as you're saying, it's quite layered. Um, the issue of xenophobia. I mean, you look at how the security guard, his perspective on that, uh, uh, and, and, and it's that... Um, I mean, it happens a lot, especially on social media now, that we see a lot of people kind of... Uh, it seems there's a perception that working class black people in South Africa are specifically feeling that the, 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 world, well, the share of um, the national pie of the national pie yeah. is being eaten away yeah. mm -hmm. by these foreigners, you know. And, the, and, and it's, a crazy, it's a crazy narrative because first of all, I deliberately made them uh, Sisutu speaking, like they're from the Abasotu. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that speaks to the fact that this is Afrophobia, it's not xenophobia, you know? Um, when these views are expressed about, oh, they're taking our jobs, it's specifically aimed at Africans who don't speak Sisotu, don't speak any of the South African languages. Mm -hmm. And it just shows you how distorted and kind of how messed up <laughs> at some level yeah. um, these, these, these feelings of animosity and hatred. And, I, and I'm not trying to devalue it because I do understand that because working class people are feeling that they're not getting the services that sure. are promised, they're not getting the jobs that were promised, and so who do you lash out at, mm -hmm. you know? The person that doesn't look like you, even though they're black like yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> what I found interesting was the whole, that the Sutu people feel like <coughs> they're foreigners here. Mm -hmm. For me, that was an interesting discussion. No, no, but I, but I knew, but it, it's quite nuanced she, in the she, way that she, she... She knows it intimately. She's got domestic <laughs> workers all from there. Yeah, but, I, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, but it's quite nuanced because they don't feel it as violent. If they were from yeah. Zimbabwe or from mm -hmm. Zambia, I mean... Or from Nigeria. Or if, yeah. if they were not speaking a, a South African language, mm -hmm. then it would... And I tried to, to, to bring that point across. That, but they you know, still feel The it. little girl mm -hmm. says... Yeah. You know, I mean, so far I've not been victimized, so but I do yeah. know that I'm not South African. Yeah. yeah. Uh, another, so, am I getting away yeah. with it because I can speak yeah. the language, or you and, know, is my day coming? An and also, she can the, hear, yeah. she can hear the violence that's that's being yeah. said yeah. out. Yeah, yeah. The, that, that at, everybody's those, talking yeah, about. That you know, so she's like, oh my God, I can hear it, and then I must feel like it's coming. Yeah. Sorry, so you wanted to jump in? Yeah, but I've also found that interesting is that Lesotho nationals have to get a permit to come here. For me, I find that very strange because they almost feel like they, they should be part of, you know, and they But speak. there's a border, remember? <laughs> they're more closer. Total. <laughs> there's a border. <laughs> Total they, border. They, they're closer, but somehow even the whole, the permit requirements, it, it's almost like, I don't know, I feel like they've got even, a, you know, greater access and they should actually, it should be easier for them, but it isn't though. Mm. They also mm. speak of struggles in the same way of, of getting into the society. Can I, can I raise another theme that, that, I, that I thought was really interesting? I mean, you're talking about how, you know, in the details of long-term relationships, mm -hmm. they, they hard work. And one of the themes that I really enjoyed in the book is sort of exploring 
what happens when the sex runs out and asexuality affairs, yeah. yeah and the one character i thought he's <laughs> going to be on the down low this one he's going to come everybody wants to that one the down low i was like yeah and everybody wanted this guy to be on the down low i wanted the hot rugby player in Sue's one to turn out to be at least bisexual <laughs> um, i didn't get that so Sorry. i thought okay the, the game was a little bit out but you know what is really interesting we 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 don't explore asexuality Yeah. And for one of the couples to deal with asexuality is really interesting. Yeah, I mean, I, I had to speak to uh, some, I, I only found one person who was willing to talk about their asexuality, but I, it actually occurred to me when I was doing research on this particular topic is that asexualities, or asexual people must be the most unseen people in the world, yeah. you know? Yeah. Uh, and that must be quite alienating because if you think about it, uh, you know, everybody's obsessed with sex it's a world where everything is about sex and you have this person who just who who has to play along and fortunately for him because of religion of his religious background and the shared values with his partner he's able to kind of you know uh, get away with it for quite a while in the marriage until he can't yeah and that's the thing with sexuality you can't fake it forever Yes. <laughs> you know, it is going to catch up with you. Yeah, and, um, and it leads to all sorts of interesting yes, things. Yes. And then it also is a springboard for a really interesting second half in terms of the plot development, which I mm. thought was really fantastic. Mm. Zukuswa, you've been incredibly, incredibly prolific. Tell us what you've been reading, what have you been up to? We, you know, yeah, I've been thinking a lot about children's books that we're also going to have in the series. Mm. And I thought Zukuswa should be in every single one of these episodes. Maybe we can start off by you just announcing... and uh, the new cover reveal that you did recently on Facebook. Oh yeah, yeah. No, I um I'm writing, well, I I just finished and it's going to come out in in May. The um, the Black Pimpernel. Uh Yay. um fictionalized biography of Mandela's time during that time, you know, before he went into prison. So yeah. And uh I had a lot of fun with it. It's coming out with Pushkin Press in the UK and um Yeah, it's and 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 I'm one of uh eight writers in the series uh worldwide. That's so That's amazing. Yeah, and hopefully they're also hoping to have it on television or the or the series. Nice. So that's going to be really fun for the kids, I think. Made in essay? Made in essay is coming back. <laughs> and what I did with it this time around, it's um it's stuff that I mostly mined from her. The domestic work. <laughs> I enjoy that book so much. In the unlikely I event that someone doesn't know the title, can you briefly tell them what it is? Made in essay. It's another example of a work that is humorous but serious social commentary. I love that. Made in essay. Tell you ways to live mm. your madam, and it's really like uh, it's got the different types of madams and the different type of domestic workers. And of course, because the domestic workers know their madams better, that section yeah. is larger than. you know but what i did with this um new one coming out is i i did a few edits and i put the contacts in the maid section of ccma in the different provinces so that the domestic no, workers we, we are in trouble <laughs> can such <you> out <laughs> yeah. but yeah no uh I, i i've always had a lot of fun with that book and i laughed so much even and when particularly i was in the so called new south africa yeah. there's so many different madams from your indian oh, yeah, madams certainly. your black madams oh, yeah, no, your no. angelas yeah uh, you know this is classism no no ma your suits your suits yeah thank you but that, that that relationship is one that often isn't ex- isn't explored Um, and and it's really rich for exploration. Yeah, and, and when we do explore, it, we often think about the white madam and the black um, domestic worker. Domestic worker. Mm-hmm. And then But there are the, all the, these other nuances. Yeah. You know, there's like you know the 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 the, the poor white madam, for instance. You know, they always have like a blue bull's flag in the house. Hi, bull. <laughs> <laughs> I I kid you not the other day when I was at gym with my instructor he was he was he couldn't wait to tell me he said yo did you see that black kid that just came here I said yeah he said he's got a white nanny wow. who drives him around <laughs> he's black that's not a nanny that's an au pair that's right exactly what I said that's, that's completely what I said now obviously these are exceptions but it, it, it's really interesting 
to look at complexity in a society where we can be so reductionist in mm -hmm. our descriptions of race relations. Mm -hmm. What I love about that work of yours mm -hmm. is that it, it plays with, with all sorts of stereotypes that people have about what the dominant power relationships are, mm -hmm. when in fact power is now being diffused in all sorts of ways. Plus, mm -hmm. yeah. largely. Yeah. We've only got a minute left. What are you guys currently reading? Sue, I'll let's start with this. you. I just finished this. You've, just, you've yeah. just finished? So. Do you recommend it? I would recommend it. Definitely. You know, it, it's a romp of a read. I mean, and the humor, you know, they've been together since bedtime. You know, like, I laughed out loud. You know, I mean, I think, you know, so after this, the year yeah. we had, definitely critical. So this is why you stable. read voraciously. You're also very generous. No wonder, deservingly, you have had all these awards uh, this year. We love what you do for writing, besides your own excellence. What are you currently reading? I am reading Transparent City by Onjaki, who is an Angolan writer. And, and enjoying it. He is, he is funny. He is, like you've got all these characters and you're like, oh my God, I know this person, I know mm -hmm. this person. Which perhaps speaks to how universal literature is. Yeah. Angela, you and I have got a similar problem. We read three, four things three, at the same time. Three, four things. And I try to, these days I'm, I'm reading nonfiction, which is very strange for me. I'm yeah. finally reading Sapiens because I loved uh, 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. And of course, I'm reading A Family Affair, which I'm really enjoying with my glass of red wine. <laughs> and I'd highly recommend it as well. That's absolutely stunning. And then maybe we can end with this one, because while you gifted, you love giving gifts. You put this in my hand. Uh -huh. What is it? Well, um, <laughs> in addition to being a writer and an editor and everything fabulous, I'm also a publisher. So that is Mukoma Ngugi's Weaver's Card. It's uh, literary fiction, and we published it. And this woman here is the printer. That's why it looks so good. Oh, oh, yeah. yes. Now all we need is one of you guys to get land. <laughs> So that we'll have the whole <laughs> system. Oh, wow. The yeah. whole ecosystem going, yeah. yeah. That is absolutely fabulous. Well, thank you so much for hanging out with me. And um, I'm sure everyone can't wait to go and buy your books. I really hope that they will sell like Amaguinha. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and they really, really, really are absolutely amazing. Um, thanks for being part of our very first and our wow. Pompeii edition of this particular show so we can get people to, to read and to love books. Yeah, An absolute pleasure. pleasure. Thank, Thank you so much for having very, us. That was very... Time just flew. Yeah. Yeah. Time just flies by when you're having yeah. fun and yeah. when you're talking literature. And um, I hope that everyone watching this episode will now go and look for the literature of these absolutely amazing African writers that we have that truly are a gift to our continent and to the rest of the world. I, I must say I'm loving <laughs> the passion that we get paid to be able to, to, to do and, and share the magic of books. I can listen to the authors the whole day, Joe. Yeah, I, yeah. yeah, I'm excited. Yeah, well, I want to write, I want to publish, I want to think about <laughs> illustrations. Yeah, and, and you know, listening to, to those three women were such incredibly strong writers, mm -hmm. but also such funky personalities. Yeah. I mean, you, you can well imagine what their process is like. Mm -hmm. I, I was imagining, you know, how they go about actually putting these books together. They are such multifaceted yeah. women. Yeah. No wonder they write across genres and just experiment with all kinds of, of literature Absolutely. within literature, Absolutely. you know? Let's talk a little bit as writers, actually. It was yeah. interesting to me, the, the sort of tidbits that we got from Angela yeah. about her process. She does a, a lot of work. I mean, it's one of her earlier works. She used to do a lot of prison visits to understand psychopathy oh. and got involved with this like psychopath that is completely in prison. Oh. And I thought, like, wow, that's, that's some serious, serious work that you need to do. Yeah. I don't know where she found asexual people to understand <laughs> asexuality <laughs> for, for this latest particular yeah. plot. Yeah. Uh, what are your habits when you, when you are writing? Do you do deep, deep research as well? I do. I do. And it depends on what I'm writing. And clearly, I mean, if you are writing something set in contemporary times, it's so much easier, right? Mm. Because just the accessibility of, of knowing the, the, the milieu is just so helpful. Um, but but my, my novel that I'm currently working on, which I'm, I'm hoping to finish fairly soon and, and publish next year, is set in the 19th century. And it's a world away from our own, wow. maybe. So, yeah. so all the things we take for granted, even the language we take for granted, uh, has all got to be revisited uh, in a novel like this. And, um, and that's why I'm, I'm, I was so interested in the writing mm. process and how, how they that access... That takes a lot of work, I would imagine. Eh? Yeah. Because if you get things wrong, mm. it takes one person with a PhD in whatever time period it's in to troll you. Yeah. Um, and if you get it right, you don't necessarily get praised because certain things are expected 
to be absolutely on point. Yes, yes. If you said it in this place at this time, you better make sure that you know what was and what wasn't the case exactly. at that particular yeah. moment. And you know, the history books don't always tell you that, right? Mm. There, there's some minutiae that you're looking for, like would this character have slept on the floor, for example, exactly. or a mattress? Yeah. Do you know, something really simple yeah, like that. That's a good and point. it's none of the history that's books. And you really have to kind of mine literature from that period to see what the life experience is. It's so interesting was. because for me, I, I, I often think like my process must be far more, far easier than, than yours. Because in that sense, you, you have a, a deeper commitment to empiricism, going through the archives that you need to do for your kind of work. Whereas a lot of my stuff with my legal and philosophy background is argumentation. Now, you know, it, it is a skill, but I don't have the same kind of pressure as people who need to make sure that every single empirical point that you make is factually and empirically on point. It, it's the kind of discipline that I had to develop, right? So it's not something that I had. Mm. And, and it's only through my studies, which is sort of for, form the backdrop to, to the novel that I'm writing right now, yeah. that, that I've learned the discipline. You know, mm. I've got a supervisor who has disciplined me into mm. investigating and probing the way I ought okay, to. Okay, so we ran out of time with the, with the other authors, but yeah. because you're an author and not just a broadcaster, there were some fun questions I had in mind for them to, towards the end yeah. that I couldn't get qu uh, quite to. As a reader, mm -hmm. uh, what is your favorite place to read? My bed. Oh, really? Yes, but, but there's got to be a fixture. Was that always the case, me. even Gregor? Yeah, okay. yeah. I don't know. For me, my, my bed is a very, it's a safe space. It's a, it's a very creative space as well. So I read and I write in bed. Mm. Um, I should be embarrassed I don't to want admit to that, right? <laughs> no, not at all. I think it's a cool place. When I grew up, I, I, I really don't want to induce tears from my working class background. <laughs> my grandfather had an old skadonk behind the house. And because we had a small council house full of lots of people, um, it was just too, too packed with people to always be able to read quietly. Yeah, so yeah. one of my favorite spots was to sort of go in the yard, this abandoned car, and go and sit in my grandfather's old skadonk and just read there wow. for, for as long as I could. But how atmospheric. Yeah, um, but it was mostly for functional <laughs> yes, reasons. Absolutely. It's the one place yeah, where, where yeah. people didn't, didn't come to. Yeah. You know? yes. um, writing is, is another thing that fascinates me, what people's different habits are. I... I don't know about you, but I'm one of those people who can't write at will. Mm -hmm. um, I have to feel an emotion when I write. Yeah. So if I really want to force myself to write, which I don't like doing, then I need to um, have music play yes. to make me feel an emotion. Yeah. And when I used to drink, actually, the, the words yeah. used to flow quite a lot. Now that I'm not drinking, yeah. I have to find <laughs> other prompts. What, what works for you? Well, music is, is a very useful one indeed, but I find I write best when I'm melancholic. Me too. Do you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and it just, it gets me into movie. I, perhaps one is able to just touch emotion a little yeah. more deeply, right, in that mood. So so it is often music that gets me there. Sometimes, oh, okay. Yes. I thought you were going to say hubby gets you there. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Hubby is supposed to be associated with joy, not melancholy. It's not good right? for writing. <laughs> no, not, not the best. But, but I find the weather also helps. I find... And perhaps it's the material that I'm writing now, which is it's quite an emotionally fraught novel sure. in a way, um, that, that, that on, a, on a dull, cloudy day, all of a sudden I'm able to write much easier. So I'm, I'm very really interested in the writing process yeah, of other people that is too. Absolutely fascinating. Yeah. Listen, we've got to get people to buy books. Mm -hmm. You are far better at admin than me, even though you claim not to be. <laughs> uh, obviously the best thing to do, but it's COVID-19, is to physically go into an exclusive books to buy some of these amazing books we're talking about. What else can they do? So, so they can go up and line. I mean, that's probably one of the easiest ways to do it. And, and I love it because I can lie in bed. In addition yeah. to reading and writing, I can, I can surf there, yeah. the internet. <laughs> exactly. So, so my box of chocolates next to me, you can just surf the internet, go onto the Exclusive Books website, www.exclusivebooks.co.za. They've actually laid it out very simply and very easily, right? So, so you find the categories very easily and uh, the suggestions and recommendations for you. So, so that was what I did last night in bed actually and and i was able to then look at, at some of the books we are looking at in the shows and say oh hang on that could be cool. a good, a good book to do as well so that that's one way of doing it and of course um you know we must thank exclusive books and all the publishers who've come on board uh, for this project uh, as we mentioned earlier jacana nb uh, jonathan bourne pan macmillan mm -hmm. Um, who, who are really helping us to, uh, to to uplift this whole this whole reading project yeah. that we want to launch in the country. And we will get there. We'll be a country of readers. 
Uh, we've got so many shows we're going to do, cookbooks, like we said, children's books, but also you can find us on social media, find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and make recommendations as well about what we should bring you in the series. Absolutely. And of course, these, uh, this whole series will be broadcast on YouTube, um, Instagram, um, am I forgetting any other uh, any other media that we are, are using? Wherever you are, we'll yeah. find you. Yes, we will. <laughs> uh, or you can find us just as easily. But uh, you see this, I'm looking forward to having loads of fun um, and reading till I need exceptionally thick glasses. Absolutely. Sure. Absolutely. <laughs> Take care, guys. See you soon.